Welcome to the Dark Ozarks. We are discussing the tradition of witchcraft, shamanism, and sacred plants in the Ozarks. We will get back to that in a minute, but first we want to remind you that the Dark Ozarks podcast is now available on Branson Podcast Network, Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Amazon Music, Google Podcasts, Substack, or about any other podcast platform. So many people may be surprised to hear that there's a long history of conjuring healing arts in the Ozarks, associating it with other areas, such as the Cajun and Creole traditions of the Deep South. What do you think are the biggest surprises? I think people may be surprised about just how much this tradition figures in the development of Ozarks culture over time, not to mention that there are many similarities with craft in other regions of the Southern United States, and with good reason. We will return to the arts of healing plants, witchcraft, and shamanism in the Ozarks. But first, we want to invite you to like, follow, and subscribe to Dark Ozarks on Facebook, Instagram, and YouTube, as well as your favorite podcast platform. We also invite you to become a Dark Ozarks subscriber on Facebook. On the Dark Ozarks Facebook page, click subscribe, have your login information ready, and join Dark Ozarks behind the scenes for only $4.99 per month. Your $4.99 per month subscription allows you to come with us on paranormal investigations, deep dive research, and topics too controversial for public view. The next 100 subscribers will be entered in a drawing for a free Dark Ozarks t-shirt and an exclusive signed first-run copy of the book, Dark Ozarks, The Spook Light. Subscribe today to be entered in the drawing. And now you can get Dark Ozarks t-shirts for sale at darkozarks.com and paranormalsciencelab.com. We encourage you to check out Always Buying Books in Joplin, Missouri, in person and online on Facebook and at the website, alwaysbuyingbooks.com for all of your reading needs, including a large section on the paranormal history and more. Not to mention, the building is haunted. Tell Bob and Elise that we sent you. We also want to thank Beard Engine Brewing Company in Alba, Missouri. Beard Engine Brewing is the only English-style brewery in Missouri and has been twice named Missouri's best brewery by the Missouri Brewers Association. Great beer and great food in a historical building with a noir past. And yes, their, health, their building is also haunted. Tell Nate and Tiff that we sent you. Really good stuff. <clears throat> Looking forward to being back to both locations. And yes. uh, fun topic for tonight. I think so. Um, and I do think some people will be a little surprised um, that there is such a uh, long and rich tradition of healing arts um, with uh, plants, uh, with witchcraft and shamanism thrown in. I agree. There's <clears throat> really a lack of a better term, a, a diaspora of healing traditions that are associated with the Southern United States. And something that I loved about that reference, uh, the Ozarks and other regions of the Southern United, Southern United States, because of essentially the influx of Yankees into Southern Missouri over uh, you know, at various juncture points, and sadly, or for better or for worse, uh, I'm one of those, that I do have some some, some caveats on that that uh, um, caused me to take issue with other Yankee influx into Southern Missouri. Uh, Southern Missouri, particularly the more urban areas, are are often confused with the Midwest, I was actually having uh, eaten out a couple of weeks ago, and this delightful young couple that were clearly college students on what I was, I believe, successfully presuming was their first date. And he was desperately trying to impress her with his knowledge of the area and was and she seemed to be appropriately impressed, but I really wanted to just to pull my chair over and say, pardon me, let me, let me interject. <laughs> I did not. I just stayed focused on my, uh, my fajitas and uh, paid them almost no mind. But he was stumbling over the fact that 
essentially saying um, this this part of Missouri is the Ozarks, and the Ozarks are like the South, but they're not the South, but they're sort of like the South. And they're like the South because we have milk gravy. And I was sitting there going, oh my, but the <laughs> Ozark Mountain region is a part uh, culturally and geographically uh, a, a distinct and important part of the Southern United States. And the Ozarks share a cultural lineage that stretches due east into uh, Appalachia and the Appalachian borderlands. And you really have to look at those geographical uh, or topographical land regions and understand that the region impacts the people, but the region also attracts the people in certain ways. And it is a very, in terms of the cultural development, it is a very uh, synergistic and at times a very symbiotic process. The people that you find in the flatlands are very different than the people that you find in the hills, enough so that you're, you are dealing with distinct culture groups within the nation and in many cases, distinct culture groups, even within the state borders and boundary lines. With that, uh, these are our topics for tonight, which do intersect with one another of sacred and healing plants, witchcraft and shamanism carry an incredibly strong tradition through Appalachia and uh, the, the upper south, as we, we refer to it, into the Ozarks Plateau. Very much so. And, and, and also, we can't really discount the Deep South either. Uh, there's a lot of shared um, migration uh, yeah. from the Deep <laughs> South and interaction uh, that affected practices here. So you, you see similarities, not always the same similarities as between uh, here in Appalachia as here in the Deep South and even in Louisiana, but uh, a lot of overlapping um, influences. And, and I think a, a big part of that is <clears throat> we're looking at going back to the 19th century, uh, going back pre-Civil War, what as, as settlement moved westward, what we really began to see was uh, a, a difficult to uh, make a living in mountain region cutting through the mm -hmm. center. On the north, you have extraordinarily rich farmland. Mm -hmm. And that at the time, certainly and still today, did did a couple of things. It the, several, several things were happening in the in the north, which we now think of defined as the Midwest, the Corn Belt, the Rust Belt, uh, which is where I grew up in the, the lower Great Lakes region, <clears throat> moving into the, the tall grass prairie of the Great Plains. And several things about that entire region, we're talking about a lot of Ohio, a lot of Indiana, a lot of Illinois, Iowa, to a degree the more north, large portions of Northern Missouri uh, on out. <clears throat> First of all, you have a, a, an agricultural land that produces an enormous amount of wealth mm -hmm. uh, in comparison. And you also have flat land that makes it, comparatively speaking, much easier to develop infrastructure. And then you combine that with something that North America is particularly noted for. Uh, as is Europe, but, and much less so some of the other regions of the, of the world. But we have highly navigable uh, rivers and waterways running deep into the interior of the continent. And in, in the, the primary ones, uh, the Mississippi and the Ohio and the Missouri, between those three, uh, provide direct servicing and the development of infrastructure. 
So for example, uh, from an agricultural standpoint, originally, uh, you really just needed to get your produce, your, your grain, your, your crop uh, to a navigable point on a river and you could sell it. And with that, you provided enough economic uh, reasoning and then the fact that it's flat, uh, that roads and railroads then could be built comparatively easy. And all of this adds up to, first of all, a um, enormous agricultural development, which then leads to industrial development. Uh, my quote unquote hometown uh, of Peoria before prohibition was considered the whiskey capital of the United States because we had the navigable Illinois River, we had a lot of fresh water, and we had abundant grain. And so the distilleries in Peoria prior to prohibition ran seven days a week, 24 hours a day. As much as they could produce. <laughs> Absolutely. And then that, this is a side note, but that is, um, th there's a couple of different <clears throat> uh, mm, statements of origin about the term um, um, will play in Peoria and for vaudeville and Broadway. And uh, the Peoria in question is Peoria, Illinois. Uh, there's a number of Peorias, but the, the Peoria in question is Peoria, Illinois. And the most credible origin point that I've heard of that is that doing a, a, a touring theater show in Peoria was for the touring group in the 19th century, absolutely brutal because there were several requirements. One, you would play the entire show for every time a distillery shift got done. And that was about four or five times in a 24 hour period. And second oh, wow. of all, they were the most difficult and demanding audiences that you could imagine. And so if you could play in Peoria, you could play anywhere in the 19th century. Interesting, I like that. I, I love <laughs> theater, theater lore and I had not heard that story before. Yeah, and then Prohibition came and uh, that that was all done. Uh, <laughs> replaced by Caterpillar, which is why I grew <laughs> up there. <laughs> yeah. But I think that mm, that uh, that landscape and then the agrarian and then industrialization of that landscape really, first of all, it attracted a certain type of people, but it also changed the people within it. In the much more mountainous mm, central southern region, and we're talking Kentucky, Tennessee, West Virginia, uh, southern Missouri, northern Arkansas, stretching out until it, it fans into what people think of as more of the Great Smoky Mountains and then the, the Appalachian Mountains running uh, all the way up to, into Maine and into Canada. That region was by necessity comparatively much more delayed, much more poor, uh, because first of all, you did, you did not have that mass agrarian development and infrastructure such as roads and railroads were a lot harder to build in the, the rugged terrain. And so populations were smaller. And <clears throat> you additionally, uh, on, the, on the South, you had originally plantation culture uh, and the, um, certainly a, a huge part of what we're talking about tonight owes uh, a great debt in terms of the, the encyclopedic knowledge of uh, plants and to root work, which has directly strong ties to the African-American culture uh, yes. that, that um, develop uh, within this, as well as the fact that with the relocation of, uh, uh, of Native Americans, <laughs> they were not relocating them to the best farmland, uh, the most arable land in the Midwest. They were relocating them to comparatively remote, more difficult to make a living in areas um, that 
uh, you know, w was more out of the way. All of these things said really created a, a mm, large swath of the Upper South in which um, essentially magic, witchcraft, shamanism, hoodoo, and a, a reliance upon medicinal plants, sacred plants, healing plants, over a reliance upon modern technology was able to uh, at times thrive and at the very least <clears throat> be perpetuated into multiple generations. And I think that even as, and certainly uh, economically, uh, at various times of the industrial boom, we saw uh, large numbers of people leaving Appalachia to go to work, for example, in, in Pittsburgh and Cleveland and Chicago. Mm -hmm. And the same uh, in terms of large numbers, particularly uh, post-Civil War, large numbers of African Americans moving to those same industrial centers. But once there, the, mm, the, the momentum of cultural homogenization and leaving those traditions behind became a lot stronger. I agree. And, and as the 20th century went on, uh, for a lot of people, uh, they became just sort of notions or, or wives' tales. Um, and um, almost an oddity that you might see, say, on the Beverly Hillbillies, you know, portrayed, things like that. Um, not really realizing that this is something that's been going on for hundreds of years and thousands in, in some respects, uh, particularly for uh, Native Americans. And then, of course, um, in Europe for uh, the, uh, the settlers here and their ancestry. So, um, and now there's, you know, in, in say the last 40, 50 years, uh, some of these issues have, have sort of been resurfacing as far as homopathic medicine, alternative medicine, uh, and the new age movement. Um, and um, I may get hate mail, but sometimes it's always, it's kind of funny because uh, the new age movement seems to think they discovered these things or that they <laughs> rediscovered them from 2000 year, year old Druidic tradition, which is not true. Um, it, it came from, Volt medicine, volt magic. Uh. It, it did. And something that I do think is, is interesting, time will tell on this, but I have some suspicions, I don't have any documentable proof on this, but some suspicions that the crossover between the, the metaphysical and, and longstanding folk tradition may be a little better bridged in the Ozarks, and in some cases in Appalachia, because it's not as far removed from you know, just the people themselves is not as far removed. Uh, there, it's a. I'm not still sure about that. <laughs> I, no, I, I, I think uh, intuitively, I, I agree with you. Intuitively, it 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 makes sense, but um, I I think really the New Age movement it really has its origins differently and i but i think the it, it's like two ships passing in the night they the two groups have kind of in some ways found each other some ways passed in the night and guys kind of was that a ship over there or not um <laughs> but um uh, because you, you have some similar things going on but the 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 perspective and 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 jargon etc is different and but i think it also kind of goes back to a universality that these things work uh have worked for a long time and so that um sort of the old adage about lost knowledge you know did we lose everything with the library of alexandria no, uh, and in part, sometimes because we rediscover these things because people are curious and we try to figure out what happens when you do this or that. Caveat, don't, don't just start experimenting with 
wild edibles without knowing what <laughs> you're doing. That is a very important aspect. And uh, I don't know exactly how I want to phrase it, but of course there is the, the traditional um, FDA statement that nothing that we say here uh, comprises uh, medical advice, nor is it designed to imply that anything can or would be healed with anything that we are saying. And if you have any questions, please consult a healthcare professional. Exactly. I think I did a pretty decent job with that. I think you, I think you, you did. In other words, people, you're on your own. Yes. Um, <laughs> That's <laughs> the legal disclaimer. <laughs> Oh, may the forager beware, and may the force be with you. <laughs> exactly. There is, of course, just in terms of, a, of an innate or sacred knowledge, <clears throat> there is something deeply resonant about the idea that plants are important, uh, that trees are important, that, that there are things in the natural world that do things. Um, and it is an esoteric or an occult knowledge. And I think that that is very powerful. I think it just, it, the, the imagery that is evoked therein is extraordinarily um, alluring and connective with many folks. Um, that said, we are, we are also slowly emerging from a 50 to 100, about 100 years of uh, cultural degradation, 100 plus years really of uh, saying, oh, those traditions are stupid. Uh, we have uh, modernity to bring us all of the answers. I think there's, there's two um, conflicting lines of thought. The um, sort of the, the idea of the sacred wilderness in which we go into to find occult knowledge. And that is very much contrasted with the, um, I believe it was the DuPont slogan of, um, you know, uh, science building a better tomorrow or uh, chemicals for better living or something, something along those lines. Yeah. Uh, back in the 1950s in which it is decreed that everything, and we do mean everything, is going to be made out of plastic. And that those those worldviews um, seem to exist both consciously and unconsciously within people and have a tendency to push them one way or the other. I think it, it describes the sort of trendy uh, attachment to the the health food stores and the new age movement and the uh, everything natural, but everything natural that's sort of been prepackaged. At the same time, looking at times askance at the uh, the motif of uh, you know the Beverly Hillbillies and Granny Clampett and on her moonlight midnight newt hunt uh, with all of her you know stirring things up in the kitchen to accomplish stuff and having everyone say, "Oh my goodness, that's so incredibly backwards." Exactly. I always wanted the cauldron she had out by the cement pond. That would be nice. That would be nice. I, I currently have access. They're not mine, but I, I currently have access to two cauldrons. And every time I look at them, I start thinking about a variety of Welsh legends with uh, things coming out of the cauldron, which is fun. I, I have one sitting in, in the hallway by the staircase. So. <laughs> <laughs> That was my grandmother's. It's a theme. Um, and <clears throat> I do think just as, a, as, a, as an interesting point, large cast iron cauldrons uh, were an incredibly important tool in uh, early settlement Ozarks in the mountains mm -hmm. for a wide variety of things. Uh, most notably um, when you were butchering hogs. And that's but, exactly what I was thinking. Lots of lots of other purposes as well, and yet for the the common person, uh, if you say cauldron, the uh, the the instant image that comes to mind is witches. 
Exactly. Now, the the uh, the the story that comes to mind for me um, from my family is always hearing the 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 stories of you know butchering hogs, and my grandmother, my mother, and my aunt, um, who was my was my uncle's uh, wife, um, with an assembly line of I think it was three three cauldrons, and you know they're butchering and final step is we're making large soup a large soap yes and um i i you know my my mother and my grandmother would always say they you know that you know aunt louise could make the whitest soap in the world <laughs> <laughs> it's and you know the there's there's a, a unique Mm, elemental conjuring element in soap making yes yes there is <laughs> yes there is and one of the one of the topics just to to infuse into this i think is really interesting uh is the pennsylvania dutch traditions yes uh, that that do inform various aspects and of course we're we're talking about um the very early wave of German immigration into, mm -hmm. into modern day Pennsylvania and into the more rugged and mountainous uh, farmland regions of the state. And the Pennsylvania Dutch, um, and of course it's a, um, an Americanism, Pennsylvania Dutch, because the original implication is Pennsylvania Deutsch, meaning German. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. uh, a, a lot of a good chunk of my uh, ancestry does derive its American origins from Pennsylvania Dutch, making their way from Pennsylvania to Ohio, um, to Indiana on the Wabash River, making a comparatively rapid leap over Illinois, which is where I grew up, and then landing in southern Iowa. And uh, those are the, that's more my competing com strong and loving but competing ancestry uh, with the Welsh ancestry that I talk a lot about. But what are what in terms of of these traditions, uh, the our topics, our tradition topics for tonight, what are your thoughts in terms of the the impact of the Pennsylvania Dutch? Well, I mean we 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 have some pretty strong um, Germanic settlement in the Ozarks. And um, of course they would share the traditions from that earlier wave that went to Pennsylvania. And, um, and there would be some similarity as far as plant work. Um, I think what people would associate it more with would be more on the conjure side um, with, um, uh, markings and and uh, symbolism and everything you often you see on barns and so forth and um, when people talk about head smarts and so forth that actually comes from the Pen Pennsylvania Dutch. <clears throat> Correct and <clears throat> some really interesting and powerful pre-Christian old world uh, tradition symbolism fears concerns and cosmology really was inherited through that process. I think perhaps in part because many of the people who did come over in those ways um, were farmers, mm -hmm. what would be thought of as uh, oftentimes, comparatively speaking, peasants from a, from a continental European standpoint and or certainly coming from that tradition. And these were people who were less likely to have been fully impacted by the mm, modernizing effects of uh, church homogenization. True, and I, th I think a good illustration of that is is that um, this group of people coming from what became Germany, Bavaria and so forth, are the people that are the basis of what we know is fairy tales, but you know, dark fairy tales. Most dark fairy tales that are told in the United States come from the Germanic tradition 
from the Grimm brothers. So yes. when you think of, you know, you know, shape shifting and, and, and hexes and curses and evil witches and, you know, woodsmen and spells and so forth, it's from that tradition. And, and these are the same people who, when they got over here and, and, and they're making strange marks on buildings and on doorways and so forth, uh, that their English neighbors are going, what's that all about? It comes from that tradition, but it's all a matter of protection, um, a conjuring and witchcraft. Very true. Very, very true. And one of the things that we're going to dig into tonight is the comparative distinctions between a variety of magical practitioners. Yes. <laughs> yes. But, but yeah, I, 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 I don't think we can not um, uh, at least give some semblance of credit to that tradition in the Ozarks. I mean, I, I've been places and, and seen head smarts and so forth. Uh, I, it hasn't been too long ago, maybe a year ago. I, I don't even remember what town I was in because I'd stopped somewhere going to court. Um, and um, there was the figurine uh, that I picked up and it was it was homemade. It was folk art and turned over and it had, you know, it had head smarts on it. <laughs> This is one of the things, and, and I'm going to reference um, Vance Randolph in this particular regard. And, and, you know, our Ozarkian mm, grandfather of anthropology. Mm -hmm. And Vance's work shows up in a lot of places with a lot of references, and oftentimes without any additional research to surround his work. It's pretty much just uh, pick up a copy of Vance's 1947 um those are magic and superstition book originally published by columbia uh columbia <laughs> university and uh, now republished by dover so it's not difficult to find uh pick up a copy of that and then quote it verbatim uh either in your book or on your website and say there we've we've covered uh ozark um magic and Vance would have been i think i believe the the first one to say that his work was not exhaustive um his his work he was doing absolutely the most that he could to uh go native uh to the point that the the locals in this case predominant at the time of the writing of the book predominantly the predominantly the folks around pineville uh missouri uh that would trust him enough to share but that that's a tiny drop in the bucket of the overall Ozarks plateau. Very, I mean, very much so. And I think he would also um, be kicking everyone to say, and, 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 and of course, this is part of our goal here with Dark Ozarks is don't stop with my book is what I think he would say is <laughs> we need to keep, we need to keep going and keep documenting. Um, not only the 200 year old traditions, but everything that develops. I mean, we've seen it ourselves of evolving traditions that if they aren't documented are gonna go under the radar or they get um, morphed into something else oh, over time. Sure. Very. Yeah. I, I think that these um, traditions are, by their very nature at times, in a very precarious state because they are, I'm going to reference mm, uh, to um, um, old world uh, series of traditions, one being uh, the West African. Uh, that we from which we derive a lot of of conjure, and one from uh, the British Isles, specifically the Celtic leaning portions of the British Isles, as opposed to Anglo-Saxon. And uh, in both cases, we're dealing with uh, traditional cultures that relied upon um, uh, 
uh, oral tradition and oral storytelling and oral learning to pass all of this down one to another. I do find it interesting that something that uh, even just lay people associate with the Ozarks is storytellers. Mm -hmm. And while it's definitely been diluted down from, uh, say, the, the shaman priests of West Africa or the druids of Ireland, uh, that certainly there are these, these continuing mm, psychological elements and, and I would say spiritual elements that we learn these things traditionally, not from a book, not from a university, but we learn them from our forebears. And it is something that the, the tradition of witchcraft, shamanism in the Ozarks and the resultant use of, of plants from that is something that exists under the overt consciousness of the culture. Yes. And and to it to an extent, I think that does happen in a lot of places, but um, particularly as time goes on. But I, I agree entirely there. There in you know, just ex exactly what you what really made me think of that was the <clears throat> the story that you told in terms of the figurine. Um, the individual who made that mark in all likelihood knew exactly what it was they were making. Uh, oh, I'm I, I'm sure it was detailed enough. I'm sure they did. And I, I remember even thinking to myself, I wonder how many people have picked it up in the store and looked at it and had no idea what what that was. And and I would wager that the majority of them did, you being the rare person to recognize it. Mm -hmm. And <clears throat> and so to me, that really speaks of a very quiet but very existent subculture that exists both in and out of sight simultaneously. Mm -hmm. And I think it it leads to something that we see most often in literature about you know anthropological and social and cultural literature about the Ozarks when we get into this topic. It is very odd. We consistently see <clears throat> um three three points one we don't have any witches around here or two um you know we that that's that's not going on uh but two we have individuals who can practice to say counter witchcraft uh, certainly before World War II, um, before the quote unquote modernization era. <clears throat> and three, if you know what to look for, you can pick up signs. Oh, definitely. <laughs> as you were as you were saying that, I was recalling several different conversations that I've had randomly over time <laughs> with people. <laughs> Of the, I see you over there. Right? Uh -huh. <laughs> <laughs> and and I think it's important uh, to note that these are traditions that were in existence and were being passed from one generation to another uh, in the hills, both in Appalachia, the Upper South, um, the borderland spaces in the Ozarks. A long time uh, before the development of the New Age movement and a very long time and a very long time before um, Joe Gardner started quantifying what became known as Wicca. Very much so, very much so. Um, and not casting aspersions towards uh, either per se, but um, continuity over time is an issue that both of those both of those examples have that they struggle with that ironically folk magic and, and folk healing arts actually has continuity through time back to the times that the new age movement and gardener etc yearn for <clears throat> and, and i think that 
Mm. I, I think that one of the things that, again, drives uh, a great deal of the um, modern structures is, again, a yearning to connect with that um, sacred nature. Exactly. Um, Which is understandable. It is. It's a, a you know yearning for what what you've been separated from. Mm -hmm. And and <clears throat> there's you know there's there's a great deal of this that gets lost with the with modernity with industrialization um, and just I, I I would associate. Uh, a strong similarity in terms of um, cultural erasure with uh, the same thing that we see in dialects that, mm -hmm. uh, that in, in the in a, we really can't put too fine of a point on this there is an enormous amount of uh, cultural erosion in, in almost all areas of the quote unquote modern world during and in the say approximately two decades following the Second World War. At least a, a rapid acceleration of a process that I think had been going on for, well, really, if, if you want to get down to brass tats, probably start in the Enlightenment. Yes. Period. Yes. Uh, and there's, there's a lot to benefit from with the Enlightenment. <laughs> I'm not going to argue that. Um, and, and, and I, you know, I'm I'm all I'm all, all for a few, you know, a few uh, modern conveniences and modern okay. thought processes. Yeah, and and I think that you could also argue that the um, late 18th century, early 19th century um, philosophical movement, in predominantly Germany, uh, of Romanticism, was a, a kickback or a, a pushback to uh, extreme uh, enlightenment rationality. I, I think so. Uh, definitely a, another incarnation. Uh, and, uh, and most people probably wouldn't recognize that a lot of fantasy and uh, literature today really owes to that movement. Um, mm -hmm. They would probably be surprised, but. Well, you know. <laughs> <laughs> we uh, uh, we owe uh, the the majority of the original Disney films and also the soundtrack to Star Wars um, on the um, late 18th century, early 19th century Romanticism movement because um, the uh, the Grim the Grimm brothers, uh, Jacob and Wilhelm, uh, were were highly mm, influenced by the the philosophies of of romanticism of mm -hmm. preserving of that there was great truth to be found in the villages in the uh, the the old women's tales uh in the in the mountains uh that was being lost with the industrialization of continental europe and of course goethe uh heavily is heavily heavily influenced is considered the the classical music composer of romanticism and uh, John Williams drew heavily from Goethe's um, compositions to create uh, the soundtrack to a lot of uh, um, uh, films that we all recognize in uh, the late 20th century, most notably, for me anyway, Star Wars. Yes, yes. Uh, agreed, agreed. <laughs> <laughs> I was not anticipating talking about John Williams right next to the Sassafras, but you know. <laughs> Just move it over on the shelf. Yeah, yeah. And, <laughs> and that kind of brings me to, I, um, I, I wanted to talk about, uh, no, it's just starting page one, really. It kind of, mm -hmm. I think this article is a good uh, juxtaposition of what we've been talking about and referring to Ozarkian and Haitian folk medicine by, uh, by uh, Thomas Stevenson um, uh, from 1991. And I found this pretty interesting because 
she had lived in southern Missouri and then she um, was studying uh, Haiti and traveling there and then she ended up realizing the similarity um, between the two locations as far as folk medicine. And um, I think that's a good example of people are the main continuity in this um, yeah. and how they yeah. travel, how information is spread. Cause it's easy to look at oh, the, the plants of the Ozarks versus the plants of the Caribbean versus the plants of the Pacific Northwest, et cetera. And think that, you know, that each of these areas is completely independent and um, the traditions evolve in a vacuum in that area. And they don't. By the same token, it also illustrates that people use what they find and figure out what they can use with it. They do. Uh, notable uh, points within the article is, is drawing the similarities that these traditions hold great value because if they didn't work, they wouldn't have been continued. Oh, exactly. Exactly. I, um, I, I just had a thought. I, I want to just interject mm -hmm. real quickly. Sure. So much that we talk about, and we, you know, in terms of um, witchcraft and the paranormal, et cetera, oftentimes a lot of people can push into the realm of quote unquote superstition. Mm -hmm. And especially when we deal with lore, uh, primitive superstitious people afraid of the dark. And we, we also see, beginning in the 1920s, 1930s, uh, a large uh, top-down push to say that folk remedies and medic medicinal healing plants, et cetera, is quote-unquote quackery, that it's being debunked, that it's being appropriately replaced by modernity, by modern medicine, et cetera. Something I really appreciated about this article and there's several other articles that we have in our compendium tonight that, that echo the same motif. And the motif is very simple. If these uh, processes that, that we now call um, folk remedies, if these processes uh, and if this comparatively occult or ancient knowledge did not work, these peoples would not have continued using them because these people are not interested in perpetuating a superstition. These people want results. Right. And in most of these situations, they didn't have a lot of means. So they had to resort to what was available and around them and using, let's face it, precious labor and time to to gather, to prepare, et cetera, especially for people who a lot of these people were, as you hinted at earlier, were in a subsistence lifestyle. They were subsisting, They're, you know, they were not in luxury. They, they didn't have a lot of discretionary time. So you didn't put effort into things that were futile. <laughs> no, <clears throat> you, you didn't, you couldn't. Um, and because you simply, I mean, just in terms of survivability, the population did not have the luxury to be playing with quote unquote quack medicine. What they were doing to a great deal of degree had to work. Otherwise you don't bother or you don't survive. Exactly. Um, and, and a lot, a lot of the, um, of the plants, uh, that they discuss um, are uh, put in terms of effects on the blood, of blood of purifiers, et cetera, and usually like a liver cleansing or um, et cetera. And, but I, I, I wanted to reference something in the article because I had, I had to, to chuckle. 
um, to myself, um, and she stresses that in Haiti, the, the purifying qualities, in, in particular, she's talking about sarsaparilla, um, are held to be more important because um, the emphasis placed on the role of blood in the body. Um, and then goes into that they have a, a highly developed sense of their bodies and their circulatory systems. And uh, besides instinctual, the, the blood is watched by looking into the eyes, checking the fingernails behind one's ear and through skin eruptions and bleeding. And I laughed because I grew up with my mother and my grandmothers. That's you. That's what they did. You you checked how your blood was doing by those means. Not and not only for you, but for for livestock too. And so it's like, well, they might have stressed that in Haiti, but they were doing it here too. I mean, mm -hmm. <laughs> it's. <clears throat> A lot, and I, I would I would postulate that a lot of the things that we consider to be modern and diagnostic that require today require diagnostic tools, et cetera, are actually in many cases able to be seen, able to be understood if you know what to look for and you're grown up in that tradition. Well, for, for I'll tell you, for instance, you know, a lot of you can tell about how your 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 blood is and your iron levels are by pressing on your fingernail, mm -hmm. <laughs> and it's how how quickly the color comes back. Yeah, I mean that's that, that's what my grandmother always did to 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 test if her if her if she was getting anemic, you know. Mm -hmm. And but if you aren't grow if you aren't grown up in that tradition. That's right. For me, it was like, well, of course you do, because I, I grew up around it, you know, <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> or or uh, blanching your skin with your fingers it, it, to do the same thing. Yeah. Yeah. And you can, also check, you can also check for bloating that way too, water retention that way too. <laughs> and and again, a lot of a lot of this is what we're dealing with in terms of uh, medicinal plants. I was I was thinking um, earlier today when I was driving um, that um, thinking about the material for tonight that a lot of people that uh, you know even in the region that you know sort of um, pull back at the the mention of the word witchcraft or um, conjuring that kind of thing would be surprised that a lot of them and their family actually were practicing folk magic and always had been, even mm. though in, in their lexicography, uh, they've been told that the word itself is evil. Correct, correct. And there's some really interesting, uh, well, Words are weird and uh, and powerful things. Uh, the book on Appalachian magic that mm -hmm. you're referencing uh, that you have the book. I have uh, I have uh, yes, um, actually I excerpts. have the book here. It's Backwoods Witchcraft Conjure and Folk Magic from Appalachia by Jake Richards. If anyone's interested. Mm -hmm. Yes, um, the the excerpts that I've looked over are uh, are excellent. I even just from from reviewing the excerpts, I highly recommend the book. But there was there was some references, I believe, after that build up. I hope the references are in this of the many things that I've read over the last uh, forty eight hours. But <laughs> the. <laughs> Um, the interesting use of words and the interesting use of contextualization for, yes. for example, um, uh, a yard doctor, a granny woman, and a witch. Mm -hmm. And we're in, in all three cases, we're dealing with individuals who are in, in variety of ways skilled in, you know, all have the same skill sets. Yes. 
and all have a very similar esoteric knowledge, um, but all have different, and I would potentially propose equally important, though oppositional, archetypal roles to play within the community. True, true. Um, and, and I think that's it's almost a moving target in a way because they play different roles, but are they really that different? You know what I mean? Um, mm -hmm, I do. I, I mean, there's, and I, I, would, I would even go as far as to argue that the, the roles being played, and I suspect that we see this in, uh, um, in, in continental Europe and in the British Isles, and certainly during high points of witch hunts uh, during the early modern era in Europe, the the ever moving scale of where any of these people would fall at any given time um, varied widely and wildly and very and very depending upon essentially the Mm, the the zeitgeist of the community, the spirit of the community, <clears throat> the the momentum of group think, uh, the the pressures of fear, the pressures of um, top down uh, authority, and how much how stalwart the community was in terms of a resistance to outside cultural homogenization. Are you going to, for example? Um, you know, and there, there's there's a wide variety of ways of looking at this, but say, for example, what we in the hills would reference as a yard doctor uh, or a granny woman, uh, there were many instances in which a English, Welsh, Scottish community with top down pressure from uh, the authorities and from the church would, uh, the community itself would break apart in fear and target um, essentially a woman that had been living in their midst and they'd been going to for help for for a very long time and suddenly she would become the the scapegoat uh, she would become the person to to target and destroy and you can't help but think uh, a bit like uh, you know I've seen a bunch of chickens go crazy and peck another chicken to death yeah and and then they and then after the chicken's dead, then they're just sort of wandering around with a dopey look on their face, going, "Okay, now what?" Mm -hmm. um, at the same time, I know that there's there are also stories. I, I can't quote the the source citation on this, but I know I've read the story of a, um, of, a of a Welsh village that there was outside pressure, outside church pressure, uh, to turn over their granny woman, and they basically said, "She's our granny woman, and you don't mess with her." Uh, mm -hmm. because we need her. Mm -hmm. And and that made, I mean, that makes perfect sense. And, um, and just the tenor of that story uh, resonates in, in, in the United States. I mean, that, that's the quintessential Western movie. It is. <clears throat> it is minus the overt witchcraft, but the theme, the archetypal themes are there. And, and I think that they provide a, you know, aspects of certainly what we're supposed to learn from this is, uh, is to um, separate ourselves from group think, to separate ourselves and begin to look at these situations, not in terms of, of, uh, broad and official dictums, but to look at them and say, what about this person? Mm -hmm. You know, who is this person? And, and an, an encouragement not to look at people as broad swaths or people as things, but instead to look at people as individuals. And if the community as a collective whole can see that, uh, it creates a much safer environment, I think a much more positive environment, but we are always at risk and always being threatened to essentially out, 
um, outsource our opinion, outsource our morality to uh, larger voices or monolithic structures. It, it's it, to be honest, it's 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 a uh, psychological way of not taking responsibility for your own actions. It is. Uh, you know, it's not me. It's this authority it's telling me. <laughs> and um, yeah. And and. <laughs> And, 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 if think, I'm, and, and if I'm wrong in what I do, relying on that, well, it's not really me because they told me. <laughs> exactly. You can you can shirk the, the personal responsibility, which, of course, is a is a hallmark or the the allure of group think uh, yes. I can. These can be my actions, but I'm not actually responsible for it because it's the authority structure. and I'm just going along with it. It's also uh, really opens the door to extraordinary levels of hypocrisy, which we see. Uh, time and again, say, for example, with the Scottish witch trials, that many of the people who were suddenly condemning uh, a witch to death were essentially, you know, the week before her clients. Exactly. Well, I mean, even even a North American example is Salem. Um, mm. You know, you it, it was the same kind of situation that, um, you know, often, you know, people turning on each other and um, and I, and. Uh, I find it interesting that, you know, I, I have an ancestor that was there that um, Captain Flynn, who uh, initially was accused of witchcraft and then before it was over with, served on a jury. I'm yes. not sure. I haven't delved into all the records to exactly see how that happened. But, yeah, he, he went from being an accused to being on the jury. So. <laughs> Which is, you know. If it's frightening. But. True. Of course, in terms of. Uh, you know, the continuation and, you know, the creation of posterity, uh, those are the sides you want to be on. Well, considering the side of the family was from, I, you know, <laughs> I, I imagine he was a bit witchy. I'll just say that. <laughs> it's, um, uh, and I found that it's, it's under the, the subheading, which is underneath superstitions and charms. Uh-huh. Um, the the excerpt that I was specifically looking at, and um, well, I guess we might as well just dive right into witchcraft at this point, just for the fun of it. Um, <laughs> but I, I, knew, I knew you really wanted to. I did. I really did. That was uh, and 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 here's okay. So as as a uh, consummate. I have to find something weird to listen to on YouTube, but in order to go to sleep six to seven nights out of the week, um, there's a surprising amount of these types of topics that leave me going, okay, where's the, where's the good stuff? Um, you know, you, you got me all hyped up for the thing, but then we don't really talk about the thing. And so, yeah, I really want to talk about this crap. And, you know. And and I can vouch for that because he sends me the videos. So I yeah. <laughs> yes, yes, I do. <laughs> and some of them are <laughs> I'm left with the same thought. So. <laughs> <laughs> and and again, I think it 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 comes to this innate need uh, that many of us have, um, the the allure of the of the spooky, and something that a very uh, deconstructionist postmodern world doesn't answer is this the occult eccentric uh, metaphysical spooky realm and it's very 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 true and before we delve into the, the yeah. witchcraft straight on I, I want to reference um because I I, I just I, I like the way it was that was put in this book um uh, under uh, down devil's run stories and superstitions um yes uh, and, and the author goes through a series of stories that as i'm reading this it's like well i you know we have that story you know 30 miles from me we have this story 100 miles from me um so he's talking about stories of um of a place called Devil's Looking Glass and a haunted uh, cliff. Uh, we 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 have our Indian princess uh, committing suicide, um, and it just goes down, 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 including tales of the the little people um, 
etc. And all these stories, I'm thinking these are these are our, our ghost tales you know, of the Ozarks, um, just with different names, including um, hearing hoof, you know, hoofbeats, you know, um, and it just goes on and on. And I like then, um, and I'm over on page 17 for your reference, where he says, by now you're probably wondering how these stories have any connection to folk magic. <laughs> Um, the tales show the mindset that mountain folks have had for centuries in these hills, bearing that of their ancestors of the old world. The same mindset was held by the native peoples. Back in the day, people would come home from church on Sunday and be just fine with talking to the dead that roamed their land. These stories are woven on battlefields, embroidered by the pulpit and choir, and hung on the clothesline in the holler in the yard on the lonesome center of the lonesome center. Um, each tale adds to the culture and community beliefs of the people. And I think that's just very well put. I do too. I think, and I find it, first of all, I find it incredibly beautiful. Second of I all, I, I find it a very powerful um, and comforting and very sophisticated cosmology. I do too. And it just, well, and, and it's, it, uh, it really mirrors my experience, my own experiences, particularly, I guess I should say. So I, I wanted to kind of slide that in there before you get into witches. I I, I think that's, I, I'm glad. Um, I, I saw that quote as well, and it really resonates with me. And I'm, now, now, now here's the part where I may get the hate mail. Um, I We trade it off. Yeah, I know. It's fun. Uh, post office box uh i don't care but the something that i would really challenge a lot of my um, fellow evangelical christians of which i am one is that we have really uh been impacted by a postmodern secularization of our faith and it is a a postmodern secularization that really um dares us to to secularize uh to secularize everything around us except for uh these these very distant bits uh and the the very distant bits and pieces uh that we connect with for example uh when the church is full on uh, near christmas and near easter and the rest of the time, we can't be bothered with that because we're too busy being modern people. We're too busy um, essentially being incredibly uh, selfish, blinded, commercial uh, consumers and uh, usually pushing our own agendas and our own opinions around on one another. That's a bit scathing, but I don't care. And there's a you know, to the point that it is taking uh, reality TV ghost shows and ghost hunting shows to attempt uh, to fill that gap, I would say imperfectly, or, and that's not really a criticism of the ghost shows, the, the ghost investigation shows are doing what they're designed to do, but in terms of how the, the consumer is, is uh, mm, connecting with it, is imperfect in terms of it's imperfectly building a cosmology. It is a limited cosmology that we have lost because we have unnecessarily stripped, coming back to the quote that you just read, we've unnecessarily stripped this beautiful and comforting and holistic uh, view, I would say not of the world, but a view of the cosmos, a view of the, the physical realm combined with the spiritual realms that has sustained generation after generation of generation of, of Celt and, and Germanic peoples and West African peoples and all and, and Native American peoples. And, you know, you strip it out. I think my more conspiracy minded side says, you, you know, you strip all of these things out and people become rudderless and they're, they're much more eager to find solace in, for example, a, you know, a new religion of commercialism or consumerism, and we're easier to tame and domesticate and herd. 
but we're also left with this intense longing and this idea that there's something else and you know you you throw them a, a horror movie or a ghost show or the conjuring series and people are like oh my gosh there's something here but i don't quite know what well i i i agree i mean and and i think what happens and i like the way you you, you put that um hadn't quite put it in that terms before with the role that the shows are playing but i think i think that's fair and of course they're not trying to create a cosmology um and even uh per se investigators what we do on saturday night um mm -hmm. <laughs> are, are not necessarily trying you know looking at it from that perspective per se but i think that people are trying to put the pieces together naturally to be perfectly honest it you remind me of a conversation that uh, we had in a, a cafe in greenfield <laughs> missouri several years ago that was basically at the beginning of what became dark ozarks um and a conversation um about um so you know who who who's interested in the supernatural and the paranormal mm -hmm. and um and and whether you you know from one perspective or another are you supposed to be mm -hmm. and you know i've always looked at it that if if you have any interest in spirituality why wouldn't you and i think sure. it goes back to that traditional notion of you can go, you know, you can walk out of the church and go home and sit down at the table and converse with your ancestors or the, the dead of the of, of the land. Mm -hmm. And and it would, you know, uh, some people would find it very disconcerting the number of churches that are haunted. That's true, actually. I I I I've, I've been at a number and investigated a number, actually. <laughs> and I've I've been in a few that you know you go oh hello. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and and in my case is nothing nothing negative nothing inappropriate I've, nothing I, i've never i've never had a a, a a negative experience in a haunted church I, I i won't say that there might not be but right i mean there's the capacity to have negative paranormal experiences anywhere mm -hmm. there i'd say relatively speaking you know fewer and some areas some some structures some lands uh, have a higher propensity for negativity uh, jefferson city missouri state penitentiary comes to mind per se uh, you know and just because the chapel may be there doesn't necessarily change that <laughs> right right um i i, I want I'm, you know, throw you a curveball. I this is not in our notes. I'm just uh -huh. curious as to your thoughts. I don't have I, I have not developed an opinion on this. I find that hard but, to believe, whatever it is. Well, that's true. I'm just I'm I still just don't know. Um of course the uh, this is a charming trivia fact for people who are like, I want a trivia fact to stump people. What is the difference between a graveyard and a cemetery? whether it's connected to the church. Yes, with the cemetery being not and the graveyard being connected to the church. Yes, basically with, consecrated land, consecrated land. Are. And that, that comes up to my question, which I am still pondering on, which is, are there any situations in which consecrated land actually means something or is it just a church tradition? And I don't know the answer to this. I mean, everybody can have an opinion. I, I like to think that in some cases that it does, um, and certainly it plays a huge role in, you know, like traditional vampire films, but beyond that, you know, a lot of our experiences is sometimes these locations are haunted, sometimes they're not, um, they're oftentimes a lot less haunted than other locations that might seem less likely. But, but about the same you know, by the same token, I guess if 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 you wanted to look at it, if that if, if concentrate consecration itself were a factor, cemeteries 
over you should have more haunted cemeteries than graveyards yes and i i mean i i can't say that i've had any experiences i'd say yay or nay or that even trying to kind of mentally go through stories that i know from other people i i can't say that um and ironically with a vampire again that's we we have to thank Bram Stoker for that because traditional vampire law lore does not necessarily does not it, consecrated land is not dependent on that. Yes. <laughs> um, in, in traditional lore from Eastern Europe or Western Europe or Greece, etc. Um, and in fact, if if you want to look at it that way, if, if you if you look. Um, at Anne Rice's um, Vampire Chronicles, her take on that is more akin to traditional lore on that, mm -hmm. you know, where, you, you know, uh, I, just, I don't remember which which book it is, that it was not watched in the Notre Dame and, and it is bemused that it has no effect, basically. <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> oh, yeah. Yeah, so I, I, I think that's more that we have more to thank Bram Stoker in Hollywood for that. I agree. I, I think the so I guess the the mm, initial survey conclusion is no. <laughs> that, that's my in, initial impression, yes. <laughs> <laughs> I just I it's one of those things that just surfaces out of my subconscious every once in a while and I'm like. I wonder. And uh, I, and if anyone if anyone has any particular stories, let us know. Absolutely. Um, always always excited to hear from people, and we do on a regular basis. We do want to thank everybody who yes. you know, regularly contributes and sends us ideas, sends us personal experiences. It's phenomenal. We're always excited to to be able to get those and be able to. We, we are. It's it's a big part of the mission, I think. It, yeah, because this is a community. Uh, it's a community within the Ozarks. It's a community outside of the Ozarks. And I love being able to have this technology to be able to, you know, share in this way and let other folks share back with us as they feel comfortable. And if, you know, and again, if it's if it's something that you feel like you need to share, but you don't want it public, we 100% respect that. Uh, in private messages, emails, et cetera. So, mm -hmm. uh, yeah. And, Always. uh, and and I, I you saying that remind me. I just want to thank we have a lot of uh, followers and fans who contact us that are far flung from the Ozarks, and we thank you all very very much. Uh, again, one of the beautiful things about this connected technology is that we we can connect with people all over the world and all of, all over North America and 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 across the Atlantic, across the Pacific, and it's just incredible. It really is. Now, which is? Which is uh, excerpt uh, from the aforementioned publication. Um, the fact that, first of all, that witches are different from um, doctors and healers. Yes. In, in terms of how uh, mountain folks see them in terms of the roles. Mm -hmm. uh, witches were thought to have made pacts with the devil, uh, read, the, read the Bible backwards, and consulted with demons to gain their conjuring knowledge. This belief stems from Europe, primarily where these same beliefs are rampant throughout records of the Inquisition. Witches were said to go through initiations into black magic, whether it was shooting a silver bullet at the Bible while cursing Jehovah or waiting in the family cemetery for the devil to arrive and have intercourse with him. While most accounts of true witchcraft uh, follow no such belief, it is apparent the reputation of a conjure person uh, was primarily based on the attitude of the community. The yard doctor was seen as a circumstance born healer gifted by God, and although they could be found mixing up some revenge for a client's enemy, they were still labeled good, as the community believed their powers to be a gift of the Most High. The witch, on the other hand, was susceptible to a much harsher judgment from society. 
It was believed that the outcast crazy woman up the holler was mixing up poisons, dancing with the devil, and tossing curses from her perch. There are stories of witches charming cats uh, and, co and uh, collecting them in bags, cursing cattle, and blasting crops. Uh, those that were documented in these tales uh, were the yard doctors. But of course, that was fine because the community thought well of them, uh, and the rest were often unverified tales. The lines between the witch and the yard doctor often are blurred at best and non existent at times, save for the reputation given them by the community. And perhaps a little professional competition. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. yeah. And, and the yard, yard doctors uh, won the spin war on that one. They did. Um, but they did not lose the long term, they did not win the long term PR campaign because outside of people who study this, nobody knows the term yard doctor. That's true. That's true. And and from the out from from the outside, uh, there is very little differentiation. And um, although there would be some that would take us to task on that, but <laughs> um, but the, I mean that that's that's true, and um, and I think one thing to to know, especially as we're talking about um, healing plants and sacred herbs, etc., that one of the roles that which is serve was for protection whether it was to protect you from you know the supernatural from a ghost etc or you know the you know the the hets of an enemy or whatever but they also came down to a lot of their um tools of the trade were using plants and herbs yes um that's a, a great deal of the of of the tool set and these are, if you know what you're looking for, uh, particularly in a rural environment, these are, they're not hard to come by. No, they, they aren't. Um, and very, very common. Um, uh, you know, chamomile for infants, even a little catnip. Don't give your mm -hmm. child catnip, please. But um <laughs> don't, don't hold us account for that one but that is something you know that would be done it would and you know some of some of the uh plants involved just like you mentioned with catnip um would be instantly recognizable oftentimes culinary herbs like rosemary uh mm -hmm. and basil um uh, have uh, you know, have, have been referenced and, and utilized. Uh, echinacea, um, a lot of people recognize echinacea. They don't realize, oftentimes don't realize that it's purple cone flower. Uh, mm -hmm. And I think it's funny. Um, um, purple cone flower got to become readily apparent in uh, native or indigenous landscaping starting in the 1990s. It was much less seen yeah. in urban settings before 1990, before the 90s, and then it got highly popularized. It's easy to grow, and the, the seeds are easy to propagate. Um, I grew up growing stuff, and I've got a couple of semesters of horticulture under my belt. So there, you know, this is private and personal uh, passion of mine. You can't tell it by looking at my yard because I don't have time to do anything out there. But it's, you know, before, um, again, generally speaking, before the 90s, um, you really would have had to go to like the tall grass prairie, typically to see purple cone flower. And since yeah. the 90s, you can practically fall over it uh, in urban and city landscaping, which I think is funny. It does make me happy because they are beautiful. Uh, but echinacea is an immune stimulant. Um, you know, properties of the plant will stimulate the immune system, uh, sometimes overstimulate the immune system. So again, yeah. you want to be careful in terms of how you use it. Uh, 
elderberry, uh, black walnut, mm-hmm. uh, sassafras. Uh, sassafras is, is so sometime in the, again, in the run, I think around the 90s, maybe a little bit before, uh, sassafras got uh, stuck with a carcinogenic label. And I can't speak yeah. to that one or the other, uh, other than the fact that the FDA labeled it as such. So do with it what you may. Uh, but from a historic, a cultural his, you know, uh, <laughs> um, standpoint, um, sassafras was used for generations, mm-hmm. and, uh, and and not just in the Ozarks. Uh, one of our good friends in Illinois. This is my first experience. We growing up in Illinois, uh, I was very mm, fortunate that we had a lot of timber, and I spent a lot of time in that timber. Mm-hmm. Um, and many, not all, but many of the species we're we're dealing with a uh, deciduous um, uh, hardwood temperate forest, and many, though not all, of the uh, plant and tree species that I grew up with on our near thirty acres uh, of old growth uh illinois river valley forest crosses over in, in terms of the same trees and plants that are down mm-hmm. here uh i could run around up there with a lot less trepidation because we typically didn't have any venomous snakes as a general rule and uh, we do down here and also the ticks were not quite as bad so there's that but I've always felt much more home in the timber than I have anywhere else. And uh, those plants have always been my friends. And uh, that said, we had a lot of sassafras trees and uh, our much older neighbors who were sort of my uh, stand-in grandparents because my grandparents were a long ways away. Um, uh, Bud uh, Vanderheide, he was a, a World War II veteran. And uh, at one point he was like, I need some sassafras root. And so I remember we all traipsing up into one corner and getting, you know, taking a spade and digging up a small sassafras tree uh, so that Bud could make some sassafras tea uh, because he had grown up with that tradition. And this is interesting because Bud actually grew up in urban Peoria, Mm -hmm. uh, but is a very poor second or third generation German family on the river. And the the bulk of their food uh, at the time, and this would have been the 1920s, 1930s, uh, came out of the Illinois River, uh, predominantly in the form of, uh, literally in the form of uh, catfish and muskrat. Mm-hmm. And uh, and he had a, an interesting insight into, for example, making your own sassafras tea every spring. Mm-hmm. My my mother did, and and um, and her family came. Uh, um, part of it came out of Texas, and part of it out of Oklahoma. Um, but yeah, sassafras tea. Mm-hmm. It's very beautiful, and sassafras is easily one of my favorite trees. Um, mm-hmm. if, if you crumble the 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 leaves of the bark up, it smells like lemon. Mm-hmm. And and they are they're a beautiful tree any time of year. They are exceptionally beautiful in the autumn. Yeah, I agree. I agree. And that uh, of course, um, um, folk berries, folk salad. That's mm-hmm. an interesting one. Uh, there's a great reference in the oral autobiography of Harry Truman, in which the author. Uh, Merle Miller is quizzing him about his mother's propensity of having picked and cooked uh, pulp greens, mm-hmm. and uh, and and Harry Truman is chiding Merle uh, for not knowing these things because, as as Harry Harry notes in the book, um, you grew up on a farm in Iowa, you ought to know this, and. <laughs> <laughs> And uh, Murrow references the existent reality that 
if you pick, um, the, first of all, um, pokeberries are poisonous. poisonous. Uh, and the leaves and the shoots of poke will become poisonous after they grow up to a certain point. Mm -hmm. And the younger leaves are not, but you still, I believe, have to uh, cook and wash them a couple of times before you eat them. It, well, uh, it's always a good idea because in case it's, they're starting to to, to mature. Deter, as, as my grandmother would say. <laughs> and there's a... Uh, 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 a reference in the book and the oral biography. My my hats off to Merle Miller for including it because he asks Harry Truman, "How do you know?" And Harry Truman looks at him and he says, "Because you pick them when your mama tells you to." <laughs> I like it. I like that. <laughs> Um, now, the, oh, now, and and again, do not recommend this. Uh, even some, there is some tradition um, in, in Appalachia and uh, the Ozarks that at the beginning of the spring, um, to I've heard this of, of eating one berry, uh, <laughs> but um, would not recommend it, and certainly, you know, but you know. I don't recommend it either. There's, and and I think there's a, there's a, a wide, the, just as a as a as a point of similarity, if you've grown up in these traditions, knowing what to do, how to do, when to do, is natural. Mm -hmm. uh, but if you have not grown up in these traditions, to the very best of your ability, find someone who has, and talk to them. Exactly that it really reminds me of uh, mushroom hunting because I, I, I grew up hunting mushrooms, uh, morel mushrooms. Mm -hmm. And I can recognize a, a morel. I can recognize uh, a false morel. And that's no big deal. But you don't, you don't do that on hearsay. You, you don't go out and just start randomly picking things and consuming them uh, without you know, not knowing what's going to happen. And there are a lot, there's a, there's a, a handful of people that I really want to get with and, and study because there's a number of really interesting um, mushroom species that are edible. I'm very interested in learning the craft and it is a craft. It is a, it is an occult knowledge. Um, of of properly harvesting and and you and and cooking them i'm interested in culinary mushrooms just for the clarification on that and uh that uh but at the same time like um you know the the chicken of the woods uh dryad saddle um etc cetera, etc cetera. but even having grown up harvesting morel mushrooms on on our land I am not about to go start randomly guessing um, on on other mushroom species that I that my family's not familiar with. Exactly, exactly. It's not something to play around with. No, it's not. Um, interestingly enough, um, tea made from willow bark, the inner bark of the willow tree, is is a very long-standing medicinal used as a fever reducer and pain reliever. And mm -hmm. what's interesting is that the, uh, the, the willow, uh, which for the record, um, uh, the weeping willow, there's native species here, but uh, weeping willow uh, originally come from China, but it's um, Latin name is um, Salicaceae Salix Babylonica. Well, that was its original name uh, because when they were naming it, when Linnaeus was naming everything, uh, he thought that it came from the Middle East. So he gave it the Salicaceae Salix Babylonica. And then later they found out that the reason that everybody thought it was native to the Middle East was um, it had been brought from Asia and mm -hmm. planted 
for example, in Babylon. And so it has since been renamed Sinensis, um, uh, Selicatiae um, Silex um, Sinensis, when Sinensis is the Latin referencing China. And, um, but of course there's, there's Willow here as well, but I think it's interesting because the um, um, salicylic acid that is in willow bark is the same ingredient aspirin. that is in aspirin. And, and actually, and actually, originally, um, that I mean, that's where they found it was from use of willow. And mm -hmm. so, um, and I think the original formulation, I think even the original formulation for Bayer used specifically willow. willow to, to yeah. distill it. So. Um, whatever process they had to go through, but um, which is a very good example of these things do work. Um, they do, yes. And you know what, say berry aspirin, etc. The companies did is basically take that folk medicine and put it in a form readily available for people, um, and right. so that that's. That, that's an example of folk medicine direct to your uh, medicine cabinet. Right. And, and you know, in terms of uh, the, the attractive qualities of modernity, it is mm -hmm. mm, a lot easier to buy a cheap bottle of aspirin than it is to go harvest your willow bark. And, 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 uh, and, uh, create it yourself, yes. Um, and another aspect of, of going back to the witchcraft, I, I do find interesting is that traditional um, yarb doctors or and witches both in the mountains use it that spirits were associated with their work. Um, and this may be, I, I don't think you got this at CERT, but um, that often spirits would be seen as they were, were doing their plant work. Um, and uh, that handful of these spirits have been recorded and identified in the practice of the Appalachian doctors. Um, and that often they would talk to them not specifically to a particular ghost, but just talk to the spirits. And that at times there would be manifestations of, of mist taking the, the shape of a, of a, of a person, um, including um, toking on a lit a tobacco pipe. Interesting. What are, what are your thoughts on that? Um, sounds like hoodoo to me. <laughs> um, oh, with the heap and help and a John D. <laughs> yes. <laughs> um, to me, it makes it makes a, a lot of sense. I mean, to me, it's a lot like it's veil walking almost. Um, uh, and and it's just like what we were saying earlier about um, people being at home in all aspects of, of life with these things. And um, to me, it, it makes as much sense as anything else. And um, it's almost ancestor work in, in a way that uh, um, somehow the spirit, spirits are assisting. Yeah, yeah. And, and I think that that's, <clears throat> and again, there is a, a, a perennial dichotomy that exists that depending on which direction the conjure goes mm -hmm. just like which direction you're planning on using the the plants exactly uh, these can be healing um or they can be very harmful exactly and a conclusion to this is that patterns occur throughout these tales especially with the class of spirits we call haints. These varied spirits are, are called by many names, such as spooks, hoodoos, boogers, mares, and angels. 
Mm, that's a that's a wide gamut. Mm -hmm. And I'm sure that would um, upset some people that angels are uh, included in that. But it, to me, it makes sense. I mean, and I, I know you've heard me say it before. I think that a lot of uh, interaction that people have with spirit um, or when they think they have a guardian angel as an ancestor. Um, mm -hmm. But this in particular, you know, you know, I guess the question becomes, are, are they human spirits? Maybe yes, maybe no. Is, are they somehow in, intrinsically connected with the work itself? Um, um, and so, um, but I, I think it's I think it's very telling that it is a part and pa parcel to all of these things that they you know, spirit exists all around us in many forms and many times whether we want to acknowledge it or not mm -hmm. and and something about this practice acknowledges it i think i think so and, and i think that, that again is a more holistic cosmology and there's something innately resonating about that that we we find it attractive, um, we find it perhaps alluring, but I think we also find it a little bit scary in in the case of. And again, I'm talking about general public. <laughs> Your unspoken disclaimer. I know what it is <laughs> for for two of us. Uh, yes. <laughs> um, it's. Uh, it is, <laughs> it is fun, but I do, I think, I, I think that, you know, that there, there's, and, and I would also, you know, to, to provide an addendum to that. I think that occasionally individuals are, mm, find it um, lurid and attractive because other people are afraid of it true uh, which i think is fun um and interesting and and worthy of uh of analysis because the the word which still carries an enormous amount of cultural impact even today it does and you know and and sometimes those those are sometimes those are positive um Sometimes those are negative, both just culturally, but also including, uh, you know, negative connotations or or simply too much baggage to unpack for the practitioner. Maybe not so much for the practitioner as as for the general public looking at the pra practitioner. Yeah, and I, I guess I, I should I should I should further the caveat, the idea that uh, for the practitioner. It's easier not to use the term because I just don't have the patience to explain it to y'all. <laughs> I like that. Yes, I agree with that. I agree. With that. Um, speaking of, we were talking about trees, willow, etc., and and um, uh, walnuts uh, are very interesting. And in, in in this particular con connotation is that. Um, um, one use of walnuts is actually to take walnut leaves and scatter them about the house at sunset and leave them until morning uh, when you sweep them out to get rid of troublesome spirits. Mm. I like that. I've never done that. I haven't. I haven't done that um, uh, either. A few, you know, cedars used a lot and. Mm -hmm. uh, but um, but I had not heard that about walnut leaves. I had not either. Um, you know, some of, some of the plants that are involved um, in uh, may apple, which is poisonous. Um, uh, Jack in the pulpit, which is one of my favorite. May apple and Jack in the pulpit are two of my favorite uh, spring plants. Mm -hmm. And uh, I actually, uh, 
may apples grow in groves they're blooming right now mm -hmm. and um the they grow in communities i've always associated them with the fae because they to me they're incredibly magical and they have beautiful um, blossoms that are hiding typically underneath the uh, umbrella and they're also um they're they're the communities are interconnected they they run tubers beneath the soil and then come up and reproduce that way and I found uh -huh. that out because uh, one May at home, when I was probably about six or seven, I decided I wanted my very own pet May apple and went out and dug one up. And uh, once you, you uh, sever the tubers, they, they don't make it. So my transplanting efforts were a failure. Yeah, but you learned. <laughs> I did, I did. I never dug up a May apple again. Uh, <laughs> uh, dried uh, wild ginger. Dandelions, I find this particularly interesting. Uh, <clears throat> uh, dandelions are wild edible, providing that they haven't been sprayed with a uh, pesticide. Right. And that dandelions uh, were brought over by the early settlers. They're native to mm -hmm. Europe. They were not native to North America. Uh, I can almost hear everybody who tries to have a perfectly uh, beautiful uh, suburban yard wincing at that reality um but i, I like i love dandelions i absolutely adore dandelions um and the reason that they were brought over was because the early settlers relied upon them um, they were incredibly important crop and dandelions have quote antimicrobial anti-diabetic anti-inflammatory benefits and are also a powerful diuretic so they, um, in addition to being used simply for nutrition, they were also a medicinal herb. Yes, and um, they and they are edible. Um, mm -hmm. And um, my daughter-in-law is, is this time of year. She's walking outside. She probably has one in her hand that she's nibbling. So. <laughs> And um, uh, cattails, golden seal, uh, the aforementioned purple coneflower, aforementioned pokeweed. Um, that uh, uh, one that's a little more troublesome is black cohosh. I, I love this. This uh, particular reference, I love this quote uh, from the old ways digging native medicinal herbs from Ozark Country Homestead. And the, the quote says that equal parts of poke, berry, and black cohosh were used to cure arthritis. Chopped fine, it was put into a quart jar and filled with moonshine whiskey. This is on page 32. Uh, a tablespoon twice a day would either kill you or cure you. <laughs> Just be careful. <laughs> <laughs> approach with caution. Um, mullein weed is, um, and for people who don't know which one that is, it's Verbascum thapsus. Um, the Latin plant name is Verbascum thapsus. And um, mullein weed is, mullein weed is great because it grows in, on the roadsides. It, mullein will grow where grass won't grow. And yeah, it takes have, very little soil. Very little, very little soil, very little water. Um, and there's there's a number of documentable benefits to, for example, mullein weed tea. And um, I've got a uh, a bag of it in my hutch uh, for, for a variety of things. I have a lot of medicinal herbs in my house. Uh, and uh, I, I highly... I appreciate uh, the effects of, of mullein tea and it, you know, doesn't taste bad. <laughs> it's always a plus. <laughs> it, is. <laughs> it is. Of course, things like um, raspberry leaf, uh, peppermint leaf, um, the extremely controversial comfrey because everything online says don't use comfrey. Uh, there's a 
long old time compendium of uses for comfrey. Again, you're on your own. I'm not telling you to do anything. I'm just telling you what the um, historical record has noted. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and interestingly enough, that may actually wrap us around if we come to uh, on on my notes on page thirty seven, uh, the Native American um, heritage of ethno botanicals. Okay. Uh, for treating diseases, ailments, and injuries, and that is a reference to the abstract, uh, which is uh, was written by William. In Setzer, uh, and the, the the title is the phytochemistry of Cherokee aromatic medicinal plants. And I do think it's important um, the a wide uh, variety of Native American traditions are infused into uh, Ozark's traditions of everything that we've been talking about tonight. Well, and and and. Um... It made a lot of sense because a lot of the tribes that were relocated west and ultimately into what is present day of Oklahoma came from um, the eastern Appalachians. And yeah. so um, they, again, it, it, it's, it's a matter of using what was there so that their traditions were centered around the plants that they knew and a lot of the same plants exist here. So um, as everyone ended up this direction, um, information was shared, et cetera, but a lot of it was coming to the same conclusions based on all of that. It was, and, and dealing with the same raw materials or the same, uh, the same plants. Something that I find interesting, and I think we're going to get into more of the, the Cherokee shaman work, is that the, um, for example, the, the Cherokee shaman perspective is, to me anyway, notably different than uh, the European perspectives. Yeah. Uh, it's different, different differences. Yeah, it's is something that, and I, you know, when reviewing the material, and this is not the only, this is not the first time, um, referencing back to our uh, Cherokee Black Magic episode from about a year ago, that I find it unbelievably fascinating, and I have, a, I hold it in incredibly high respect, um, but it is difficult for me to wrap my, admittedly North uh, European ancestral mind around yes um i mean there, there there were a lot of there are there are certain aspects of these crafts that both mindsets kind of approach the same way but there there are definite differences that um you you can't look at the same way and i guess hold simultaneously um, cohesively anyway. Mm -hmm. And of course the, the raw materials, I, and raw materials is probably a misnomer, but the, the plants involved uh, remain largely the same. And that, mm -hmm. that part is, is easy enough for my, me to wrap my head around. Um, the reference in this particular article just for a little bit of need, so it's not uh, purely theoretical in terms of what we're talking about. Um, the, the Cherokee medicinal plants referenced in this article uh, include yarrow, uh, black cohosh, American ginseng, uh, and blue skullcap. Mm -hmm. And <clears throat> those, not only do they have a, a really long uh, ancestral importance with the Cherokee, they do with other tribes as well. And of course they do with, um, you know, they have European counterparts in many cases. True. And another one um, is uh, witch hazel, mm -hmm. and which 
you know, there there is Ozark witch hazel, um, and um, which uh, use as an astringent as well as for treating injuries, insect bites, infl um, inflammations of the skin, that kind of thing. Um, and of course, it was also used in Europe, a different variety of witch hazel, but um, so all of these traditions use it as well. And, you know, I find, I just find the, the naming of that interesting because it, again, it uses the word witch. Yeah, that's true. I mean, and, and I meant, I, you know, I grew up, we always had witch hazel in the house. Oh yeah. Very much so. And, you know, and jumping, jumping subjects, but I do find it mm, just interesting in terms of how the association of witch or witchcraft effects there's a um what i'm specifically thinking is the uh which is brooming that will take place in trees um mm -hmm. there's, a, there's a particular fungal blight that if the tree contracts it uh the um branches will grow profusely but in a very gnarled and blackened way mm -hmm. and the, the the vernacular term for that is which is brooming Huh. Well, and I guess it's from the stereotypical hag motifs with the gnarled hands. It is, and and of course the the broom motif and the sense that which is being associated with blight. True, true, specifically blight. The this is a really interesting article, mainly because it's just. Uh, very, very in-depth, uh, references blood root, uh, mm -hmm. native to Eastern North America. Uh, this is on page 43 of our notes. The plant has been used by Native Americans as a traditional medicine for a variety of ailments. The Cherokee used a decoction of the root in small doses for coughs, lung inflammation, and croup, and a root infusion was used as a wash for ulcers and sores. Roots are rich in isoquinoline alkaloids, um, and the traditional Cherokee used as a blood root as cough medicine or respiratory aid, as well as for treating ulcers and sores, can be attributed to the antimicrobial activities of those said alkaloids. Mm -hmm. And which, of course, translates to um, analogs in you know Western medicine. So. It does. It does. Um, everything from NyQuil and Vicks, you know, your your chest expectorants, mm -hmm. um, and your and your topical antimicrobials, even as simple as rubbing alcohol. Mm -hmm. That uh, uh, fever few and jumped over to page forty one. This is a different article that I'm referencing. Uh, a guide to common medicinal herbs from the Health Encyclopedia. Uh, you know, a uh, fever few was traditionally used to treat fevers. Who would have imagined? Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, by that name, but, you know, uh, we we joke, but that that is one of those things that um, you know traditionally, and I'm sure around the world, a lot of things would be named that way. So as you taught the next generation, you know, it is you know name it what it does. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Oh, very, very true. Um, garlic, I think this is particularly interesting. And, um, you know, garlic, we we cook with garlic, we love garlic. Um, garlic has antimicrobial, um, cardioprotective and anti-cancer, anti-inflammatory properties. It is believed to help support the immune system in very unique and powerful ways. An interesting bit of information, um, the uh, mm, essentially the, the continental European monasteries, one of the things that the monks very typically grew were profuse amounts of garlic, and they utilized garlic heavily, and during um, the, the beginning in 1347 with the spread of the Black Plague, um, 
monks who were consuming large amounts of garlic were less likely to die of the plague. That, does, that doesn't surprise me. Another, um, another thing that was handed down through my family and I, is that eating more garlic, you tend to be, get less tits. Mm. I'll start tomorrow. Uh, <laughs> and antics are blood sucking. And how do we get away, get rid of vampires? <laughs> so maybe that is where it comes from. I don't know. For, from from that, maybe that is where that bit of vampire lore comes from. I don't know. <laughs> um, the uh, um, saw palmetto and valerian root are two other uh, traditional medicinals. And uh, I was, the last time I was in Florida, I was admiring the saw palmetto berries. The saw palmetto was one of my favorite plants, just to, you know, trees to look at. And I, I always associate it with the, uh, the Atlantic coast. And uh, I will also want to add that ground saw palmetto berries do not taste good. <laughs> I'll take your word for it. <laughs> <laughs> I um, just continuing. I'm that one. <laughs> <yeah>. <laughs> I'm continuing on. Uh, still on page 47 of our notes. I thought it was really interesting. Again, do not eat any um, fungi that has not been properly identified by a qualified professional. Some are deadly when ingested. All edible wild fungi must be cooked. Okay. Yeah. Disclaimer done. Dryad's saddle. And I found this really, really interesting because, um, you know, of the folkloric connotation with the word dryad. Mm -hmm. um, and, and I don't know how, uh, hmm, how fair this is, but I have always associated mushrooms with the fag. You've always what? Associated mushrooms with the fey, mushrooms and toadstools, with uh, with fairy well, there's a, well, there's a there there are a lot of motifs in, in, involving them, and of course, um, in Eastern Europe, they're directly associated with elves and Santa Claus. So, yes, when and we we've, we've uh, that actually is an excellent segue into shamanism. Well, I do want to say real quick for anyone that was wondering, what is a dryad in, in folklore? It's a it's a wood spirit. Yes, <laughs> which is very appropriate in terms of just the the clear associations mm -hmm. uh, with all of that, and you know the again, and I can't think of the name of it, but it's the the uh, the very beautiful. Um, little red capped toadstools that induce that and they they uh they do interesting things to you apparently if you consume them i have not experienced that probably won't but it the the red cap is associated with the uh shamanistic red that becomes part of santa claus's yes. um, color safe. scheme <laughs> And, uh, and, 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 and again, I, and, and specifically a, as a metaphor for the shaman. Yes. And I find that, I find that really neat. I also, you know, and we're, we're dealing with, uh, mm, a very Northern Scandinavian, specifically a, a Lapland Finnish tradition. Mm -hmm. And these were, uh, the the Lapland shamans, from my understanding, uh, I don't have notes in front of me because we're a long way from Oklahoma right at the moment. What we're talking about, but that uh, the the Southern Scandinavian, particularly the Christianized Southern Scandinavian um, authoritarian or governmental structures, in the very early years of the Enlightenment, we're talking 1500s, 1600s, uh, had a lot of issue with the Lapland shamans and the and that culture 
and there there's you know some really interesting discussions that can be had and i do think that this is relevant uh discussions that can be had where we see the the conflation of magic with evil in an attempt to stamp out these practices and essentially homogenize and christianize the people very much so another another old world um, example would be the druids and rome villainizing mm -hmm. them in the same way as sorcerers yes yes and um I, I think that that's, you know, looking at that and then looking at the traditions at hand are important in terms of the overall contextualization that's, that is, is possible. And, you know, the, the, you know, something just as, as an interesting point, if memory is serving correctly on this, and I hope that it is, since we're documenting these on video, is that um, the, the original uh, root word that we know as troll uh, actually referenced magical practitioner or more and, and in some cases specifically a female magical practitioner and so it was is conjectured I think uh, um, effectively conjectured uh, that the 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 shift of that word which originally would have meant uh, magic with an emphasis on a female shaman into essentially a troll ogre, uh, mm -hmm. a, a hideous creature that is dangerous, was is conjectured to be part of a larger, essentially smear campaign against these more outlying shamanistic cultures. Well, the, the grotesque um, uh, hag version of, of a witch using mm -hmm. grotesque in the classical sense of the word. Yes, and I, I think, you know, and, and again, like referencing, coming back here to, to, you know, just land on witchcraft for a moment, the witches in question uh, that were, were targeted uh, or identified, I think certainly in Appalachia and the Ozarks, there was a lot less... Mm, intense or authority structure targeting, although there was quite a bit of identifying or identifying the idea associated with. Mm -hmm. But there, there seemed to be a little more in Arkansas than, than Missouri, actually, from some of the research I've done. But, agreed, agreed. And I'm not really sure why. <laughs> I'm not either. I think that's 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 something I'm excited about getting into, and if, if anybody has any anything to throw in on that, I would be excited to hear. Um, and but again, the the imagery associated, regardless of how accurate it is, is an immediate connotation of witch with hag or crone. Yeah. And I think it's particularly interesting because when you go back to the um, the core mm, motif, the, um, the archetypal motif and the importance of the witch is that uh, the witch really, in, in many traditions, many European traditions, is um, the goddess in three. Yes. Uh, maiden, mother, crone. And mm -hmm. typically... I, and perhaps simply because it was, it's difficult to, um, you know, it's a lot easier to vilify the crone and, uh, and, and the, than it is the maiden. Mm -hmm. uh, that what we're left with in terms of the imagery of the witch, the traditionalist imagery of the witch is uh, almost universally the crone. Yeah. Um, when it when when it's in a negative aspect, um, when it's mm -hmm. in a positive, it tends to be the mother. Yes, yes. Um, and you know, and and I think I think it's a, a good example of how potentially mm, well-meaning doctrinal structures or plans or ideas 
can inadvertently hack apart a contextualization that's really important. Um, because the, you know, to me, the, the larger archetypal message uh, of uh, maiden mother crone is, uh, first of all, the, the acceptance uh, of the cycle of death, of life, death, and rebirth. Mm -hmm. And when you separate those apart from one another, potentially, I'm going to conjecture here, if you make the mistake of separating those, you might, for example, wind up with a highly commercialized society that is absolutely obsessed over youth and stops listening to um, those who have uh, gathered through many years of study and years of experience um, very important life lessons to pass on to the next generation. Can't imagine. No, I can't imagine a society like that at all. I can't, <laughs> wouldn't even recognize it if it smacked me in the face as I was walking through Walmart. Exactly, or if you tripped over your TV. <laughs> <laughs> I know. <laughs> and and at the same time, I mean, you you know, and here's here's an interesting. Mm, you know, just thought because I the the takeaway coming back to Grimm and witches, uh, Grimm brothers, I should say, uh, Wilhelm and Jacob, that uh, you know probably the the most mm, singular story that we're all familiar with is Snow White, mm -hmm. and, and then I'm going to reference. Mm, the movie that I'm not still not entirely sure how I feel about this film, um, Snow White and the Huntsman, with uh, Charlize Theron. I did like Charlize Theron in that, um, mm. and I also like the crows. <laughs> really like the crow. Uh, I had, I I had this thing for witch animals, um, you know. Huge spoiler alert. If you watch the film The Witch, the villain is the Billy Goat, and he's my favorite character in the entire thing. Because um, he's he is a sweet boy. I don't care what anybody says, he is a sweet boy. Um, it wasn't what the script said, but I'm talking about the actual animal. Mm -hmm. And um I don't disagree. <laughs> Everyone else in that film was unbelievably neurotic and they constantly mumbled in the Northumbrian accent. I understood the goat, okay? He didn't even say anything. I understood the goat more than everybody else in the entire cast. That's my, that's my film review. My grumpy old man film review for the, uh, uh, for the night. But <laughs> the, I think it is interesting because the, the, the importance certainly from a, um, in ancient mythological cycle, the importance of the of the witch is to represent the 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 goddess in three, mm -hmm. and and perhaps the lesson is that when we mm, are in cyclical balance with this mm, resonating motif. We are not at, we are less at risk of essentially cursing ourselves. Well, I, I think, I think I, I like the logic in that. I hope it's true. Yeah, I, I, I hope it is too. Um, and it, it certainly is one of those, those things that makes, um, for myself, uh, makes growing older more palatable. I was just thinking the same thing. <laughs> it's like age. I, I accept that view more and more. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Even even if it's not true, I'm falling with it, and it's going to make me happy. So, uh, you know, there there is uh, there's a quality to that, but there is also to me this is really an interesting conceptual motif because. And uh, it's implied in other versions of Snow White, but it is really explored in the Snow White and the Huntsman. 
because um, the queen, who is an evil witch, uh, is killing people in order to remain the maiden mother. Yes. And because she is trying to not become the crone. Yes, and, and actually, you know, there, there are a couple of um, real world analysis, uh, analogies to that. Um, oh, I just went blank, the one that in Italy and then one in New Orleans, um, La mm. um, Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. But the, the European alert. one, I just went blank on the name. Huh? Uh, say <laughs> disclaimer alert, this part's really gory. Um, Yes. Um, yeah, I don't have the notes on this, but um, the I'm going to get this wrong, but I'm going to throw it out and it may be enough to spur our memories. But um, like the Countess or Lady Bathamy. Yeah, I was just saying it's it's a B. Um, it mm -hmm. starts with a B, but I couldn't. Um, and that may be it. But yes, yeah, she she bathed in the blood of of maidens. Yes, yes. And what's the, I'm trying to remember the New Orleans, because that one is just creepy as I'll get out. Yeah, the LaLaurie Mansion, um, she, um, and I, I, I forget how the, uh, the police were called in. I, I can't remember if someone escaped or what, but she was basically holding servants prisoners in the attic and torturing them and um, bathing bathing in the blood, not, not full bathtubs, but um, washing her face in it and drinking the blood, et cetera, trying to preserve her youth. And um, the, the state of the servants that they found, there were accounts that police officers literally were vomiting. This brings it's up. A, it's also supposed very, to be one of the most haunted buildings in the world. I can imagine why. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I can absolutely imagine why. The I want to visit. Um, the, oh, it's on my bucket list. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to drag. I'm going to drag you there when we go to New Orleans. <laughs> oh, you won't have to drag me there. I'm. I'm in. Um, this is. This is a. Um, just a, an interesting segue that I want to play with for a moment before we get to the Cherokee shamanism. Okay. But most typically um, when we're dealing with, with very grisly or gruesome crimes, as, as a general rule, it's men committing them. More, the, more often than not, but the, but there are, I mean, there have been a number of, female serial killers over time, but not nearly as many. What, um, uh, this is just like freewheeling conjecture moment. Um, you know, I do think that the, the female serial killer motif really uh, resonates in, in very deep-seated emotional ways with many people because it is comparatively unusual. Mm -hmm. uh, and women what are supposed are, to be nurturing. What's that? And women are supposed to be nurturing. Yes. I was going to say, what, um, what do you feel like? What, what are your thoughts on that? Both in terms of the disparity that it's typically men making those kind of, uh, as, as a general rule, but also um, some individuals who do happen to be women. Um, you know, going down in history mm -hmm. uh, for for having committed an extreme form of crime. Um, I, I think one reason that you you uh, see fewer female serial killers, um, and whether it's nature versus environment, I, I, I don't know. Men tend to be more risk taking. Um, tend to be more violent rates of crime, et cetera, anyway. Um, and I think a lot of that goes back to the tradition of 
men being warriors going to battle um, mm. and um, processing emotions that way. Uh, yeah. Whereas um, women, uh, I, I think that because traditionally women had more the role of taking care of the family day to day, um, making sure that uh, systems and pl- institutional systems kept running outside of say uh, government or church. I mean, and we're talking historically um, that the village fell apart if the, if the women went on a killing spree much quicker than if men did. Um, <laughs> You know, some people might disagree with that, but I, I think there is something to that. Um, and also, I think once you get to the dark ages, uh, particularly women who acted out in a unsanctioned way tended to be punished disproportionately for their crimes. Mm-hmm. Um, whether it was you ended up being burned at the stake more often or or, or whatever, um, women aren't supposed to do that. So we make examples. I mean, men might not saying that men didn't go to prison and were executed, but there was more of that ostracization and community, um, uh, that group think of no, we, we we don't want this happening. So we we make sure that the examples are horrific, uh, even in comparison to other executions, et cetera, often. Um, then I think one reason why y- you do see some of those examples, I, I think Bathory, Bathory, Lady Bathory. Bathory. Yes. Uh, and LaLaurie. Lady Bathory. Yes. Um, one could be mental illness, some sort of mental illness contributing to some sort of psychosis or narcissism um, around youth. Um, And in both of those situations, they were extremely wealthy. Um, Mm -hmm. Bathory basically ran, I, I, I don't remember it wasn't a kingdom, but uh, she she basically had a huge amount of land uh, mm-hmm. and vassals. And so, and, and we're in situations where they controlled the purse, swing, the purse streams and had the power. They, they were not the wife of the king or count or whoever. Um, and so I think you had a combination of mental illness and unrestrained power, which yeah. even, mm-hmm. even and we, we certainly are all familiar with examples of that with men that end up with countless uh, horrific uh, deaths. Bad, Vlad the Impaler is an example. Um, mm-hmm. And so, but others tend to be often more outsiders or certainly not as uh, privileged of a situation. Um, and I can't remember her name, one of the first female serial killers in England was a woman who ran an orphanage and um, she, um, uh, young unmarried women would um, send their babies there to be taken care of ostensibly to be uh, hopefully adopted. And she was killing dozens and dozens of children. Um, And no one really knows why she didn't really profit from any of it. Um, So something, psychosis somewhere but again um those are similar profiles to say jack the ripper so it is it is which does bring up something that crossed my mind uh what if jack the ripper wasn't a man actually there 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 have been some theories on that um the um the uh the mutilation involved denotes um, anatomical knowledge. So they tend to they tend to look uh, look at suspects that were doctors, butchers, 
mm -hmm. the midwives would would fit in there, etc. Um, and actually, um, an example from here in the Ozarks, the Staffelbacks was that uh, uh, the testimony that Nancy Staffelback was so um, calm and cold in um, during the murder of Frank Gilbreth and um, her son's having shot him and everything. She walked up and slit his throat with a corn knife and then yeah. wiped it off and walked home and finished chili. Um, probably comes to the fact that she was a midwife and was used to lots of blood. Yes. <laughs> oh, which... So yes, it, it is It is possible. Um, there, I, I, I've read some experts who say they, they aren't, aren't sure that a woman would have been able to overpower um, all the victims um, and, and done the mutilation the way it was, um, uh, conjecturing not enough upper body strength. But I don't know. I mean, if midwife, maybe. Mm -hmm. well, coming, coming back to the stuffle bags, uh, although, you know, devoid of the shamanistic uh, or ritualistic aspects associated with uh, with witchcraft. There, there's certainly some some witch aspects to uh, to Nancy Staffelbeck's um, life. Well, yes, I mean, she you know, she she was a um, a midwife. Um, and out of necessity then ran brothels, um, mm -hmm. was married to a candy maker. I wonder if you ever built a house. <laughs> several. That I, had. I don't know if they built them, but they had several. <laughs> I was specifically and, 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 and cleaned at least one child, one son that disappeared from the record that no one knows what happened to. So. <laughs> I was I was specifically wondering if they, they built a house out of candy. Uh, candy in the woods. <laughs> uh-huh. Yeah. <laughs> it 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 really from an archetypal standpoint, it, it's kind of like hitting all of these markers of Hansel and Gretel. It 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 does to an extent, yes. <laughs> <laughs> like a like a uh, a late 19th century lucid dream of Hansel and Gretel. Uh, that's probably what people thought at the time, too. <laughs> All the way down to the German last name. <laughs> That's true. Swiss, actually. <laughs> it was from Switzerland. It's uh, mm. hence candy maker. Mm -hmm. Chocolatier. Yeah. <sighs> Chocolate's good. So, <laughs> final final segue, uh, I think, for tonight's episode is. Um, Referencing the 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 figure of the Cherokee shaman, uh huh, and and again this uh, uh, Kilpatrick, Kilpatrick and Kilpatrick uh, article. It's a lengthy article. Mm -hmm. uh, I only have an excerpt here. Yeah, I ended up not getting all of it printed, but it's but it, to me it's really really interesting the. Um, very similar in anthropological study structure to our uh, Cherokee Black Magic reference text. Yes, and and um, and it was actually published uh, in the early seventies um, in a volume from the Smithsonian um, Contributions to Anthropology, um, and, and it's entitled a, a note a notebook of a Cherokee shaman. And many of the the aspects, of course, there's um, some very essentially occult references. And I'm again disclaimer: I'm using the term occult in its traditionalist literal sense of hidden knowledge. Mm -hmm. uh, so there's some things that that are difficult um, for for us to wrap, fully wrap our heads around without more context. So, for example, on page 87, uh, essentially uh, ritual number two to Dr. The Rainbow Black. Uh, very, very uh, esoteric in that regard. Uh, but number three is what to do for arthritis. 
very practical. <laughs> um, number four, to make tobacco when they are hurting somewhere. Um, number five, to help oneself with. And something that we do tend to see in these translations is that uh, what would be considered black magic or sinister magic, magic used to harm, oftentimes has a deeply euphemistic or diverging title. Yeah, almost that neon warning. Mm -hmm. uh, number six, to attract a woman. <laughs> Uh, number man or seven. attractive man is always in the list somewhere in every tradition, you know. Yes. Uh, <laughs> in, uh, in apparently all cultures at all times. It's always a problem. For, <laughs> <laughs> <seen> one. <laughs> <That's>, <laughs> e either to attract them or to send them away. So. <laughs> yeah, I think that one's in here too. <laughs> the, um, <laughs> the, um, Mm. Oh, the 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 very shamanistic non-answer to dude she's just not into you <laughs> yes what's the translation yeah <laughs> Um, number seven, if they have gashed themselves or have been shot. Well, see, that one was updated after the Spanish guy here with firearms. <laughs> yes, it was. <laughs> and, but on a, on a serious note, yes. I mean, in terms of looking mm -hmm. at deeply traditionalist processes and rituals, um, adapting to the world exactly and i do think that's important that you, these traditions adapt over time and i'm sure are still adapting in in some places agreed and uh and in some places very much within the ozarks particularly the oklahoma ozarks mm -hmm. um, on this and, aspect yes uh yeah with the with the uh the cherokee um, number eight, and this is to go to the water early in the morning, uh, page 94 of our notes. Mm -hmm. the, um, the, the essential free translation on this says, and this is to go to the water early in the morning when one is stopped by wizards and is given up and when everything has gone thoroughly wrong, and this is to alter the situation and to rid oneself of the evil. Always one to have in your back pocket. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Um, number nine, to put a woman to sleep. <laughs> the less said about that, the better. Sleep. I, court. Yeah. <laughs> um, I'll save my further comments for the subscriber section. <laughs> then <laughs> number 10 for a spider bite. And that's not a euphemism for something else. That is, if you've been bitten by a spider. <laughs> Again, practical. Yes. Um, I, <laughs> number 13, to destroy a rival in a love affair. Always on the list. Always on the list. And at the very least, what this really speaks to, um, to me, is that regardless of culture, regardless of era, regardless of anything, the mm, problems, foibles of human nature, etc., are with us always. Pretty universal. It is. <laughs> and, and also, 
does it fit? I guess it means we're predictable. True, which is unfortunate and also fortunate. Interesting dichotomy. Depending on which side of a situation you're on. <laughs> yes. And jumping into the into the technical side, and I am mm, not well versed in Cherokee magic. <clears throat> I, I mean, leaving... I'm not well ver very well versed either, other than speaking with a few people. The 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 analysis of these references that we're referring, you know, that we're talking about tonight, and uh, and also with the Cherokee Black Magic from the episode that we did earlier, uh, which is I'm sure in the compendium of of everything, is to me very very interesting. As I'm reading the anthropological data, I can't help but get a very strong sense that there are elements of these rituals essentially the spells mm -hmm. for lack of a better word that if you were grown up in if you had grown up in and were trained in these traditions there would be a contextualization of this information that would allow it to be useful and allow it to make sense but when you have stripped the, for example, only the spoken word portions, uh, largely, not entirely, but largely bereft of the uh, familial tradition of the familial understanding uh, and largely bereft of the actual activity of the ritual, mm -hmm. that it can be preserved on the page, but literally preserved like you... Um, you know, took a medicinal plant and dried it and put it on display. And it it it, it, it can. I, I think I think there's two aspects. One that words do have power. Mm -hmm. Two, they have power, but it's that power plus something, and that comes from the practitioner in context. Um, I think in it, actually, as you were talking, an example popped in my head, one that we all know is the word abracadabra. Mm -hmm. Do you know what abracadabra means in Arabic? I used to, but I forgot. Basically make it so. Mm. It is the, it is the incantation portion of a spell. Mm -hmm. But we, because we have used it in the vernacular so much, we have sort of lost the power of the word, so to speak. Yes. I think, particularly in the West. Yes, I agree. I agree. And, and I think that's kind of an analogy here. I, I I think so. I mean, it <clears throat> to me, I just get the feeling that we're we're looking at the at the composite parts, but we're not able to understand the spirit of the thing that would give it life. I I think so, and that and and I think that that's why um, I, I think that. There, there are people. There are certain people who can walk between tr traditions pretty well. Mm -hmm. A lot of people don't. Um, and, but when you see someone who is adept in multiple traditions like that, it's very unique. And I think that's why is it's hard to do that. It is. It is, and certainly. Everything that we've talked about tonight, there is strong elements of real craft that yes. that that are involved, and and it is much more than just a head knowledge. It is a, an experiential knowledge. It is a, a connecting with one's ancestry knowledge. It's many, many different things coming together to imbue uh, the life into, 
a ritual, a life into a experience, a life into a, uh, a practice mm-hmm. that uh, in some cases and, you know, may have been irrevocably lost in time. In other cases, preserved in part, and in some cases, and in you know certain situations, the practice has been continued and preserved in whole. And yes. to to those individuals uh, who have done that, my hat is off to them and to their lineage and to their family for having having done been able to preserve those things. And for individuals who are interested in in truly doing this, um, my recommendation is to approach it. Um, soberly that this is uh, you know you're you're holding a, a generations of ancestors traditions in in your own experience agreed and it's it's um, it's a responsibility and it's a solemn one it is it's very powerful but I think for some people very well worth the investment in the endeavor i agree and that might be a good thought to end on yes and we want to thank you and don't forget to check out upcoming events and merchandise at darkozarts.com and paranormalsciencelab.com thank you again to always buying books and beard engine brewing company for helping to bring the dark ozarts to everyone on our next episode we are going to be discussing the dark history of the eastern arkansas ozarks Catch the Dark Ozarks podcast on Branson Podcast Network, Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Amazon Music, Google Podcasts, Substack, or just about any other podcast platform. Thank you, everyone. And remember, there are no easy answers in the Dark Ozarks.